The Happiness Industry by William Davies. This is chapter one. Knowing how you feel. Jeremy Bentham was sitting in Harper's coffee shop in Holborn, London, when he shouted, Eureka! The prompt was not some intellectual inspiration from within, as it had been when Archimedes immortalized the exclamation from his bath, but a passage from a book, Essay on Government, by the English religious reformer and scientist Joseph Priestley. The passage was this. The good and happiness of the members, that is, the majority of the members, of any state, is the great standard by which everything relating to that state must finally be determined. Bentham was 18 years old, and the year was 1766. Over the next 60 years, he took Priestley's insight and converted it into an extensive and hugely influential doctrine of government, utilitarianism. This is the theory stating that the right action is whichever one produces the maximum happiness for the population overall. There is something telling about the fact that Bentham's Eureka moment was not a matter of great intellectual originality, nor did he ever claim to be much of a philosophical pioneer. In addition to Priestley's influence, Bentham was content to admit that much of his account of human nature and motivation was lifted from the Scottish philosopher David Hume. He had little interest in producing new theories or weighty philosophical tomes and never took much enjoyment in writing. As far as Bentham was concerned, there was a limit to what any idea or text could hope to achieve when it came to the political or social improvement of mankind. Merely believing that the greatest happiness of the greatest number should be the goal of politics and ethics was of little consequence, unless a set of instruments, techniques, and methods could be designed to turn this belief into the founding principle of government. Rather than as an abstract thinker, Bentham is best understood as half philosopher and half technician, and from this various contradictions followed. He was an intellectual with a classically English distaste for intellectualism, a legal theorist who believed that much of what law rested on was simple nonsense, an Enlightenment optimist and modernizer who scoffed at any notion of inherent human rights or freedoms, and an advocate for hedonism who insisted that every pleasure be neurotically accounted for. Reports of his personality vary wildly, with some discovering a man of great warmth and humility, and others one who was vain and dismissive. Bentham relationship, Bentham's relationship with his father cost him considerable misery. He was a weak, shy, and often unhappy child, and appears to have been bullied into the status of a child prodigy by his father, who insisted on teaching him Latin and Greek from the age of five. He attended Westminster School, but was made miserable by being the smallest boy there. Aged 12, Bentham went to Oxford, where he was drawn towards chemistry and biology. If anything, he was even less happy at university than at school. He established a small chemistry laboratory in his room and felt a strong affinity for the natural sciences, which he pursued throughout his teens. With a little less domineering father, this would no doubt have provided him with the intellectual satisfaction that his mathematical mind was seeking. But his father was a lawyer and insisted his son follow in his footsteps in order to earn a decent income. Under duress, he became a barrister in London, London's Lincoln's Inn. Practicing law did not make Bentham happy, and nor did the continued influence of his father. His shyness made him dread having to stand up and speak in court. Perhaps he still longed for his homemade chemistry laboratory. He certainly pined for emotional and sexual intimacy, but when he fell in love in his early 20s, yet again his father stood in his way, vetoing the relationship on the basis that the woman in question wasn't rich enough. In this conflict between love and money, the measurable, thw the measurable thwarted the immeasurable. Later in life, Bentham would be an outspoken advocate for sexual freedoms, 
including the tolerance of homosexuality, which he saw as an inevitable component of the maximization of human pleasure. His career, as it developed from his arrival at Lincoln's Inn, was always a compromise between the professional and moral injunctions imposed by his father and the scientific and political urges that drove him from within. The law would indeed become the field in which he made his name, but never as his father intended. Instead, he set about criticizing law, ridiculing its language, demanding more rational alternatives, and designing policies and instruments through which government could finally escape the philosophical nonsense of abstract moral principles. This stance did not make him rich, and Bentham ended up financially dependent on a stipend from his father, who's disappointed in his failed barrister son, or whose disappointment in his failed barrister son never lifted. There were times when Bentham the technician overshadowed Bentham the philosopher. During the 1790s, his activities were those of what he might now associate with a public sector management consultant. He spent much of this period designing exotic schemes and technologies, which he believed could improve the efficiency and rationality of the state. He wrote to the Home Office suggesting that the various departments of government be linked up by a set of con conversation tubes for better communication. He drew up plans for what he termed a frigarium to keep food fresh. And he wrote to the Bank of England with a blueprint for a printing device that would produce unforgeable banknotes. This engineer's vocation was integral to his vision of a more rational form of politics. It drove many of his more famous policy proposals, such as the Panopticon Prison, which was very nearly signed into English law during the 1790s before falling by the wayside. During the late 1770s, Bentham began to write on the topic of punishment, specifically because punishment seemed to offer a rational means of influencing human behavior. If it could target the natural psychological propensity to pursue pleasure and avoid pain. This was never a merely academic or theoretical issue, and very little of this writing was published until several years later. His goal was always to achieve reform of public policy, but this did require a little deeper thinking about the nature of human psychology. Bentham was, or sorry, the science of happiness. Bentham was a fierce critic of the legal establishment, but he was scarcely much more sympathetic to the radical and revolutionary movements which were erupting elsewhere. Confronted by the political claims of the French and American revolutionaries, Bentham was scornful. Natural rights is simple nonsense, he declared. Natural and imprescriptible rights, rhetorical nonsense, nonsense upon stilts. When radical philosophers such as Thomas Paine appealed to such ideas, they were making the identical mistake that monarchs or religious leaders made when they claimed some divine or magical sanction for their actions. They were talking about something which had no tangible existence. Bentham's alternative was to ground political and legal decision-making in hard empirical data. In that respect, he was the inventor of what has since come to be known as evidence-based policymaking. The idea that government interventions can be cleansed of any moral or ideological principles and be guided purely by facts and figures. Whenever a policy is evaluated for its measurable outcomes or assessed for its efficiency, Using cost-benefit analysis, Bentham's influence is present. The great advances of the natural sciences, as he saw it, derive from the ability to avoid the meaningless use of language. Politics and the law had to learn this lesson. In Bentham's view, every noun either refers to something real or something fictitious, but we often fail to notice the difference. Words such as goodness, duty, existence, mind, right, wrong, authority, or cause might mean something to us, and they have come to dominate philosophical discourse. But as far as Bentham was concerned, there is nothing which these words actually refer to. The more abstract the proposition is, he argued, the more liable is it to involve a fallacy. The problem is that we often mistake such propositions for reality. By contrast, the language of natural science is organized in relation to physical, 
tangible things, which each word is attached to. But how a government or law be organized in this fashion? It is one thing for a chemist to attach names to specific compounds, but it is quite another for a judge or a government official to be quite so disciplined in their use of words. In any case, what are the physical, tangible things which make up politics? If politics is no longer to concern itself with abstract problems, such as justice or divine right, what will it concern itself with instead? Bentham's answer was happiness, thereby assuming that this entity was rooted in something real. But how? In what, sen in what sense is the term happiness any less fictitious than, say, virtue? To answer this, Bentham fell back on a, on a form of on a form of naturalistic assertion. Nature has placed mankind under the, under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure, and that just happens to be a fact. Happiness itself may not be an objective, physical phenomenon, but it occurs as a result of various sources of pleasure, which have a firm physiological basis. Unlike many other things that arise in our minds, happiness is prompted by something real, something objective. It reminds us that we are biological and physical beings with urges and fears, not unlike other animals. We can be scientific about happiness in a way that we simply can't about virtually any other philosophical category. If such a science could be pursued, it would provide governments with an entirely new basis on which to design policies and laws so as to improve the welfare of mankind in the only realistic or rational sense. It's possible to spot elements of Bentham's own life experiences in this psychological theory of politics. Its premise was a tragic one, which spoke of its author's own unhappiness. The only thing which all human beings hold in common is their capacity to suffer. Optimism could only lie in a wholesale reorientation of the state towards the relief of suffering and the promotion of pleasure. Bentham was known to be unusually empathetic, often to a fault. His sensitive nature made him highly attuned to the unhappiness of others. One of the great virtues of utilitarianism as a moral philosophy is this empathetic dimension, its belief that we should take all others' welfare as seriously as our own. Given that humans are not the only species that suffers, many utilitarians also extend this to animals. With a better understanding of what motivates human psychology, policymakers might be able to divert human activity towards the greatest happiness of all. The question of punishment captured so much of Bentham's time and energy because it appeared to be the most effective tool in the possession of lawmakers when it came to steering individual activity in the optimal direction. The business of government is to promote the happiness of society by punishing and rewarding, he argued. The free market of which Bentham was an unabashed supporter would largely take care of the reward part of this business. The state would take responsibility for the former part. To inflict pain on people either via their bodies or their minds was to bring politics into the realm of tangible reality and to leave the world of linguistic illusions behind. As a vision of enlightenment, optimism goes, Bentham's had a darker edge than most. Bentham's emphasis upon the brute reality of physical pain and his distrust of language can be seen as mutually reinforcing. The cultural historian Joanna Burke has highlighted the fraught relationship between language and pain since the 18th century. Either pain seems to defy description altogether, or it has been treated as a taboo subject to be experienced silently. There's a long history of viewing sufferers, especially those of suspicious character, as exaggerating or wrongly describing pain. This assumes, as Bentham did, that there is an objective reality about pain, which could be represented if only words or sufferers were better equipped to do so. This opens the way for experts to grasp or describe that reality, given the sufferer himself cannot, 
and for numbers to represent such feelings on the assumption that words cannot. The science of happiness was therefore a critical component in achieving a rational form of politics and law. It could be used to divert behavior towards goals that would be best for everyone. And as government became more scientific, so it would be able to predict how different interventions influenced individual choices. This is not happiness in some ethereal or metaphysical sense, and certainly not in any ethical sense, as Aristotle had understood it. It was happiness in the sense of a physical occurrence within the human body. Contemporary neuroscience, which consummates this reduction of psychology to biological processes, would have looked to Bentham like the answer to all of our political and moral questions. Conversely, a great deal of contemporary scientific interest in the brain and behavior has strongly Benthamite presuppositions. This is well illustrated by one neuroscientific study published by a group of researchers at Cornell in 2014. Claiming to breach the last frontier of neuroscience, namely the secrets of our inner feelings, the researchers argued that they had unlocked the code through which the human brain deals with all different pleasures and pains. As the lead author explained, it appears that the human brain generates a special code for the entire valence spectrum of pleasant to unpleasant, good to bad feelings, which can be read like a neural valence meter in which the leaning of a population of neurons in one direction equals positive feeling and the leaning in the other direction equals negative feeling. This description of how pleasure and pain operate physically is more or less what Bentham had already assumed, posing questions as to how successfully neuroscience can e ever hope to escape its protagonists' cult cultural presuppositions. For scientists armed with measuring devices to discover that a bodily organ is also armed with measuring devices sounds like a coincidence to say the least. The study touches upon one of the great controversies of utilitarianism, of whether diverse types of human experience can all be located on a single scale. The Cornell neuroscientists clearly believe that they can. If you and I derive similar pleasure from sipping a fine wine or watching the sunset, our results suggest it is because we share similar fine-grained patterns of activity in the orbitofrontal cortex. This is a relatively innocent remark when it is fine wine or sunsets that are at stake, but when profound experience of love or artistic beauty are rendered equivalent to baser experiences, such as drug taking or shopping, the claim that all pleasures are computed in the or orbitofrontal cortex in the same way becomes more problematic. Philosophers refer to this argument that all pleasures and pains can be located on a single scale as monism. Bentham was the monist par excellence. He couldn't deny that we speak of different varieties of happiness and contentment using different words, but the objective underpinning of all these forms was always the same, that is, physical pleasure. We naturally seek benefit advantage, pleasure, good, or happiness, all of which ultimately comes to the same thing. Likewise, suffering rooted in the physical experience of pain represents an entity that varies in quantity, but not quality. Once we accept that there is a single, ultimate, and physical sensation underlying all good and bad experiences and actions, then it follows that this sensation varies only in terms of quantity. Bentham never conducted any scientific research on the question, but proposed a psychological model detailing the different ways in which pleasure could vary in quantity. In his most famous statement on the topic, Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, he offered seven of these, most of which were easy to conceive of in quantitative terms. Duration of pleasure was one relatively obvious quantitative category. Certainty of future pleasure is something that we would now see as amenable to mathematical risk modeling. Extent of the population affected by an action is another simple quantitative yardstick. The main scientific stumbling block for Bentham's entire enterprise was one category of variation, in particular, namely intensity. 
How could a scientist, how could a scientist, legislator, punisher, or policymaker, know how intense a particular pleasure or pain was? Of course, one might draw on one's own experience through introspection, but that is scarcely a very scientific approach. Or one might ask people to report on their experiences using their own words. But then wouldn't utilitarianism be drawn back into the hall of mirrors that is philosophical language, the tyranny of sounds through which we describe what it is like to be human? Measuring the intensity of different pleasures and pains was the technical task on which the Benthamite project would stand or fall. How to measure. The 18th century was a time of great inventiveness in the creation of measurement tools. The thermometer was invented in 1724. The sextant, which measures angles between any visible objects such as stars, in 1757 and the marine chronometer in 1761. The introduction of new measuring tools and standards was one of the first achievements of the French revolutionaries in the 1790s. This involved the commissioning of an original platinum meter, the famous Maître des Archives, which was placed in a vault in the National Archives in Paris. The need for reliable standardized measures cut to the heart of the Enlightenment whose high point coincided with the first half of Bentham's career. As Immanuel Kant defined it in 1784, enlightenment meant mankind escaping its self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another. Unlike their predecessors, who would allow religious and political authorities to dictate truth from falsehood, right from wrong, the mature and enlightened citizen would draw on nothing but his own judgment. The motto of enlightenment Kant suggested was Saper Audi, dare to know. The critical individual mind was the only authoritative barometer of truth, but for this reason it was equally important that everybody was using the same yardsticks of comparison, or the whole project would collapse into a relativist babble of subjective perspectives. Bentham hoped to cast a similarly scientific, skeptical eye over the workings of politics, punishment, and law. In place of unquestioned beliefs about justice or common values, Bentham insisted that we should know what will make people happier and to treat every person's feelings as of equal value. He knew precisely how to frame the scientific question. Does this policy, law, or punishment create more or less pleasure across society as a whole. But what type of measuring tool was available to gather the answers? It's all very well feeling empath em empathetic to the suffering of others, as Bentham undoubtedly did, but without a standard through which different pleasures and pains can be compared, the utilitarian is exercising guesswork. On the other hand, surely the very nature of pleasant or painful sensations is that they are subjective. The search for a common measure of happiness is fraught with difficulty. Despite being critical to the viability of his political project, Bentham dedicated surprisingly little attention to this problem. Occasionally, he suggested that the greatest happiness principle of political judgment was just that, a principle, which could never realistically be converted into a quantitative science. But given the appeal to hard empirical reality that is threaded through Bentham's psychology and his scathing remarks about all forms of philosophical abstraction, one has to take seriously the sense in which he did intend to, to rebuild politics and law on technical forms of measurement and calculation. If happiness were the only human good on which it is possible to speak scientifically, then it would be strange if we didn't then pursue it using scientific methods. So we return to the problem. How is the intensity of a pleasant or unpleasant feeling to be measured? How does utility manifest itself in such a way that it can be grasped by measurement? Bentham suggests only two tentative answers to this question, neither of which he pursued in any practical or experimental way. Both involve the identification of proxies for happiness, rather than a claim that feelings themselves could be grasped. 
but in each case he unwittingly hinted towards vast zones of scientific inquiry, which would later be explored by psychologists, marketers, pol policymakers, doctors, psychiatrists, human resources experts, social media analysts, economists, neuroscientists, and individuals themselves. The first of Bentham's answers was that the human pulse rate might provide the indicator of pleasure that could be used to solve the measurement problem. He wasn't particularly taken with this idea himself, but he recognized that the body offered certain measurement symptoms or cert certain measurable symptoms of what the mind was experiencing. As happiness is ultimately an assemblage of pleasant feeling, the notion that one might be able to discover happiness levels via the body is not so surprising. In everyday life, we intuitively understand this in how we read another's facial expression or body language. A science of such signs might therefore be possible. Pulse rate would appear to offer the possibility of a hard quantitative science of well-being that transcends culture. Words can deceive, but our heart rate does not. Bentham's second answer on which he was far keener was that money might be used. If two different goods can command an identical monetary price, then it can be assumed that they generate the same quantity of utility for the purchaser. By making this claim, Bentham was well ahead of his time. Economists would only catch up with this analysis some 30 years after his death. But since Bentham was interested in what governments could do to influence general public happiness, rather than what occurred in market transactions between private individuals, he had little concern with pursuing this idea as an economist. Nevertheless, by putting out there the idea that money might have some privileged relationship to our inner experience, beyond the capabilities of nearly any other measuring instrument, Bentham set the stage for the entangling of psychological research and capitalism that would shape the business practices of the 20th century. These were and remain the options, money or the body. Economics or physiology, payment or diagnosis. If politics were to become scientific and emancipated from abstract nonsense, it is through economics, physiology, or some combination of the two that the project would be realized. When the iPhone 6 was released in September 2014, its two major innovations were quite telling. One app which monitors bodily activity and another which can be used for in-store payments. Whenever experts seek to witness our shopping habits, our brains, or our levels, or our stress levels, they are contributing to the project that Bentham had mapped out. The status of money in this science is intriguing, while political and moral concepts are attacked as empty, nonsensical abstractions. Somehow the language of pounds and pence is viewed as having some firm and natural relationship to our inner feelings. The exceptional status attributed to economics from the late 19th century onwards as closer to a natural science than a social one is one legacy of this worldview. The problem of measurement may seem like a nerdish matter of scientific methodology. Surely we all know what Bentham was getting at when he said that government should pursue the greatest happiness of all. Do we really need to get fixated on the details of how to calculate this? Of course, we can allow Bentham the, st the status of a philosopher and ignore his inventive and technical aspirations. We can look at how utilitarianism works in the abstract by playing analytical games in the philosophy seminar room. It is not clear that Bentham would have been very happy with such a legacy, and it is less clear that this is what his most important legacy has actually been. The technical, calculative, methodological problems of Benthamis or Benthamism in various guises are arguably the most transformative in how they have come to structure our political, economic, medical, and personal lives. For this reason, whether happiness is to be indicated via the body, such as through pulse rate, or via money, may prove to be of the utmost importance for how utilitarianism has actually set about constructing the world around us. However, any systematic attempt to construct quantitative measures of sensation would not begin until a few years after Bentham's death in 1832. 
weightlifting in Leipzig. On October 22nd, 1850, a second Eureka moment took place, this time in Leipzig, Germany. Gustav Fechner, a theologian come physicist who had recently emerged from a protracted nervous breakdown, suddenly realized that the mind-body problem, which preoccupied so many German philosophers, might be solvable through mathematics. He recorded the date of this breakthrough in his diary. The relationship of the mind to the physical world, including the body, is the foundational problem of modern philosophy. René Descartes' doubt about the reality of the physical world, combined with his certainty of his own existence, established a dualism between the realm of thought and that of physical things. Dualism is an unwieldy philosophical position to hold, which always runs the risk of reductionism in one direction or the other. Either the entire world might get reduced to an effect of the thinking mind, idealism, or thinking can be reduced to a merely physical occurrence, subject to natural forces, empiricism, rather than, or rather, as Bentham had assumed. Various Enlightenment thinkers grappled with this, most notably Kant, who believed he had avoided either fate by systematically distinguishing matters of scientific knowledge from matters of moral and philosophical principle. The human mind was, for Kant, something which fell firmly into the latter category, rendering any science of the psyche impossible. Fechner was a dualist, but of a peculiar sort. His ideas were formed by a highly eclectic intellectual background, which put him in an unusual position with respect to traditional philosophical problems. Fechner was the son of a pastor who, like Bentham's father, taught him Latin when he was a small child. He registered to study medicine at the University of Leipzig, but took the opportunity while there to attend lectures in botany, zoology, physics, and chemistry. At the same time, he was exposed to many of the excesses of German idealist philosophy, including Schelling's philosophy of nature, romanticism, and Hegel. Early in his academic career, he carried out experiments with electricity while also getting drawn into theological debates about the nature of the soul. The separate domains that we now know as science and philosophy remained entangled in the German universities of the 1830s. Nowadays, Fechner might well be described as a new age thinker. His genius was to find a way of bringing his disparate intellectual interests together, remaining a philosopher and a scientist, a metaphysician and a physician. In the process, he brought questions of the mind, which Kant had stipulated um, lay beyond the realms of knowledge into the purview of science. For this reason, Fechner represents one of the key figures in the development of what we now know as psychology. In what way would mathematics be helpful in solving the mind-body problem? The answer derived from Fechner's engagement with physics. The principle of the cons conservation of energy had been formulated by a number of German physicists over the course of the 1840s, with transformative implications for the understanding of basic matter. This stated that energy is indestructible. It can be altered in its form, but not its quantity. If heat turns into light or coal into heat, so the principle states, then we can assume that a single quantity of energy has been conserved along the way. This might be seen as another variant of monism. In the context of the Industrial Revolution, this discovery was a source of tremendous optimism that there was no limit to how efficient technology could become. The power of mathematics to explain all forms of change was greatly increased as a result of this breakthrough in physics. An underlying quantitative stability had been unearthed. 
Fechner's innovation was to extend this same principle to questions that had previously resided in the terrain of philosophy. If the physicists were right, then even the mind could be included in this mathematical framework. What is interesting about Fechner's breakthrough was that it didn't simply propose a form of biological reductionism. He was adamantly not suggesting that the mind was constituted by physical matter, but, the, but that the will, the thought, the whole mind may be as free as it may be, yet it will be able to exercise its freedom only by means of, not counter to, the general laws of kinetic energy. Energy as Fechner understood it traversed the border between mind and body, obeying laws of mathematics as it did so. The doctrine that Fechner proposed, known as psychophysics, argued that mind and matter are separate entities, but must nevertheless have some stable mathematical relationship to one another. In certain respects, Fechner's theory of psychology was similar to Bentham's, he too was convinced that people pursued pleasure, although less as a matter of natural cause and effect, and more as a matter of spontaneous, libidinous desire. He actually coined the term pleasure principle, which Sigmund Freud later adopted. Fechner distinguished himself from Bentham's English empiricism in two respects. Firstly, philosophy held no threat for him. Words such as soul, mind, freedom, or God referred to real things, albeit not in any physical or measurable sense. This was evidence of Hegel's influence. The philosophical innovation of psychophysics was to suggest that these entities could become known via the physical body in certain ways. The conservation of energy as it passed between physical and non-physical realms meant that philosophical ideas must sit in some stable mathematical relation to material and bodily things. Fechner was therefore a dualist in the sense that he maintained a belief in two parallel realms. One of philosophical ideas, the other of scientific facts. What distinguished him from philosophical dualists such as Descartes and Kant was a somewhat mystical belief that the two were in some mathematical harmony. Industrial metaphors were helpful here, which, which speaks of the economic context in which he was working. A steam engine involves intangible forces at work within a physical entity. Likewise, a human being must be understood as an alliance of the immaterial mind and the material body. Secondly, Fechner was intent on discovering how this mathematical relation actually worked in practice. From 1855, he set about this with a series of arcane experiments in which he lifted objects of subtly different weights to test how changes in physical weight correlated to changes in subjective sensation. If I lift, if I lift two very similarly weighted objects, Precisely how big must the difference between them be before I can tell for sure which is the heaviest? The unit of measurement that Fechner introduced to assess this was what he referred to as a just noticeable difference. Alternatively, if I am already holding a weight of one size, how much additional sensation does it cause me if someone adds another weight of half that size? Does it alter the sensation by half again? as one might expect, or by less than that, once the relationship between psychic and physical realms was properly measured, the questions of philosophy would be scientifically answerable. The scale of ambition that drove psychophysics was vast, even if the experiments which it rested on were comparatively primitive. Bentham may have designed various schemes and policies, blueprints for prisons, proposals for conversation tubes, and so on, but he had never set to work upon the human body itself or tackled the problem of measurement beyond his theoretical speculations about pulse rate and money. English philosophers tended to be biased towards privileging the physical, sensible world 
of things over the metaphysical world of ideas, but they maintain this bias from the comfort of their armchairs. It is interesting that it was Fechner, the idealist, mystical, romantic, who really dragged metaphysics down to earth by probing the body, measuring sensations, conducting experiments. Precisely because he didn't simply presume that the physical was prior to the psychological, as Bentham did, he needed to set about testing how one related to the other. This wasn't a theory stating whether mental processes were really driven by biological ones, or vice versa. It was the opening up of a new field of scientific inquiry, which by the end of the 19th century would be populated by psychologists, economists, and a nascent industry of management consultants. The quantitative and economic psychology in which theories of mind would be replaced by scales and measures, and which Bentham had merely speculated about, was now being assembled. The idea that individual feelings and behavior might be amenable to expert adjustment was also now a technical, mechanical possibility. A democracy of bodies. In the age of the fMRI scanner, it has become increasingly common to speak of what our brains are doing, wanting, or feeling. In many situations, this is represented as a more profound statement of intent than anything which we could report verbally. A 2005 article published by the Oxford neuroscientist Irene Tracy is titled, Taking the Narrative Out of Pain. The marketing guru, Martin Lindstrom, who has studied the brains of thousands of consumers using fMRI, has built his career on the notion that people lie but brains don't. In the less high-tech reaches of mental management, such as mindfulness training, people are taught to notice what their minds and feelings are doing in the present moment as a way of alleviating anxiety. Meditation helps them to observe and accept these silent processes. This poses a number of questions. How can some particular part of our bodies or selves possess its own voice? And how can experts claim to know what it is saying? Underlying these types of claims are some of the arguments and techniques that were first introduced by Bentham and Fechner. First and foremost is the distrust of language as a medium of representation. Bentham's fear of the tyranny of sounds casts doubt on the capacity of individuals to adequately express themselves. To be sure, Bentham recognized that each person was the best judge of her own private pleasures and happiness in her own life. But for the purposes of a public politics, some other means of knowing what was good for people needed inventing. Variants of mind reading technology are invented only to get around the apparent problem that language is inadequate to communicate feelings, desires, and values. Whether that technology involves money and prices or measurements targeted at the human body, such as pulse, sweat, or fatigue monitors, the science of our inner sensations seeks forms of truth that might eventually bypass speech altogether. One of the most striking cases of this ideal in action was reported in 2014 with the news that scientists had successfully achieved telepathic brain-to-brain -brain communication for the first time using EEG neuroscanners. The final destination of such developments is a form of silent democracy, peopled only by mute physical bodies. Bentham had little idea of how extensive the measurement of pleasure and pain would become, while Fechner was limited to running experiments on his own body rather than anyone else's. But taken to their logical conclusions, the work of these two polymaths points to a society in which experts and authorities are able to divine what is good for us without our voices being heard. Something important is lost along the way. In the monistic worldview of Bentham and Fechner, experiences differ in terms of their quantity, sitting on a scale between extreme pleasure and extreme pain. One thing that this necessarily discounts is the possibility that human beings may have their own considered reasons to be happy or unhappy, which may be just as important as the feelings themselves. In order to credit individuals with critiques or judgments or demands, or for that matter with gratitude or acclaim, 
we have to recognize that they possess authority to speak for their own thoughts and bodies. This means understanding the difference between, say, despair and sadness, and the ability of the person using those terms to do so deliberately and meaningfully. Were, for instance, someone to describe themselves as angry, a response focused on making them feel better might entirely miss the point of what they were saying. It might even be deemed insulting were someone to be unhappy about the fact that income inequality in Britain and the United States has reached levels not seen since the 1920s. The advice, as given by some happiness economists, that one is best off not knowing what other people earn would seem like a form of hopelessness. In a monistic world, there is merely sentiment, experiences of pleasure and pain that fluctuate silently inside the head with symptoms that are discernible to the expert eye. This has profound implications for the nature of political and moral authority. The rational, enlightened society imagined by Bentham was one in which all institutions were designed in such a way that they were perfectly attuned to the vagaries of human psychology. The job of governing a modern liberal society comes to appear as the confrontation between two types of material thing. On the one side, there is the mechanics of the mind, governed by the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain, which is no more deniable than the need to eat or sleep. And on the other, there are various material forces designed to influence that psychology. Monetary incentives social reputation, physical punishment and confinement, aesthetic sedu seductions, rules and regulations, and so on, serve no purpose unless they are geared towards the calculations of the individual. In this society, political authority lies with those who are most expert to measure and manage individuals. There's no reason why administration of this nature should be handled by the, the state directly as so many neoliberal regimes have more recently discovered. Anticipa anticipating Thatcherism and, war and warfare nearly two centuries beforehand, one of, Bentham's policy, or one of Bentham's policy recommendations was for the state to establish a national charity company, a joint stock company modeled on the East India Company, which would alleviate poverty by employing hundreds of thousands of people in privately managed industry houses. His proposal for the Panopticon also included recommendation for private firms to build and run the prisons, with a license provided by the state. Not content with reconceiving the very basis of legal authority, Jeremy Bentham can be viewed as the godfather of public sector outsourcing. Fechner pointed the way to a more intimate micromanagement of individuals in representing the relationship between mind and world as a numerical ratio. He implicitly offered two alternative ways of improving the human lot. If a certain physical context, such as work or poverty, is causing pain, one progressive route would involve changing that context. But another equivalent would be to focus on changing the way in which it is experienced. Many of the experts who followed in Fechner's footsteps were psychiatrists, therapists, and analysts, whose critical eye was turned upon the subject having the feelings, rather than the object that seemed to be causing them. If lifting weights becomes too painful, you're faced with a choice. Reduce the size of the weight or pay less attention to the pain. In the early 21st century, there is a growing body of experts in resilience training mindfulness, and cognitive behavioral therapy, whose advice is to opt for the latter strategy. The job of intervening to alter the psychological calculations and feelings of individuals can be distributed across various types of institution and expert. We classify some as medical or managerial, others as educational or penal, but really these terms are just further abstractions and fictions. All that matters is how effectively they administer their task of offering the carrots and sticks which alter human activity and experience for the better. The, in the, blah, 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 
the invisibility of happiness. In 2013, the Chettleham Literature Festival in Britain introduced an innovative form of, ev of evaluation in an effort to capture the value that it delivered to its attendees. Using a technology developed by the company Qualia, it set up cameras all around the site to track the smiles and the faces of visitors as they wandered around. Computers were taught to interpret these smiles and, and to convert them into a form of value. This, this was a more high-tech version of an experiment undertaken in the town of Port Phillip, Australia, which carried out an experiment in happiness measurement by stationing researchers around the streets who sought to record how much smiling they witnessed on the faces of those around them. A smiles per hour value was produced for <coughs> from one day to the next. Qualia's technology is still clumsy. A computer's ability to tell an authentic smile from an inauthentic one is not nearly as good as a human's. However, the science of smiling is advancing rapidly in various directions, both psychological and physiological. The physical practice of smiling has been shown to accelerate recovery from illness. The experience of seeing smiling faces has been shown to lower aggression. Experiments show that real smiles achieve different emotional and behavioral responses from social smiles. A smile is another potential indicator of and influence on what is going on under the surface, along with pulse rate, use of money, or a just noticeable difference between two weights. To these, a long list of recently developed measures could be added, from the smart watches developed by Apple and Google to monitor stress, to, to psychometric effect questionnaires used to assess depression. These are all means of rendering subjective experience tangible and visible, and therefore comparable, like the sonar technologies which are used to map the ocean floor from sea level. These tools aim to mine the depths of our feelings and bring them out into the daylight for all to see. Yet there is a perpetual une uneasiness about this project. With something as important as happiness, no measure ever seems quite adequate to the philosophical importance of the matter. We are generally content to accept that the map of the ocean floor is not the same as the ocean floor itself, but merely a representation with various advantages and disadvantages. But with happiness, there always remains a frustration. The sense that quantified smiles, heart rate, money, and just noticeable differences miss something crucial about the nature of emotional experience is overwhelming. A smile may indeed reveal something of the person, but surely not as a scientific representation. Let's consider again the foundation of Bentham's political science. Nature has placed mankind under, under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. By making this claim, Bentham hoped to strip out abstract, unscientific bases for political programs. But in what sense is his claim about nature really any, any less metaphysical? Since when did nature involve erecting sovereign masters over certain species? That sounds suspiciously like metaphysics, after all. No matter how scientific his portrait of motivation may claim to be, in its epic generality, it is guilty of the same abstraction that Bentham deplored in philosophy. And if it weren't, then the notion of happiness as the ultimate purpose of government would not be able to hold. Here's the paradox. If happiness is granted its grand philosophical and moral status as a sovereign master, we might agree that this is ultimately what life is all about. But then how could such an entity ever be measured scientifically? Whereas if happiness is anchored firmly in the physical sensory experience of pleasure and pain, who is to say that such a mundane matter carries any fundamental or political importance? It becomes just a gray, mushy process inside our brains. Too often the utilitarian route out of this dilemma is simply to duck it altogether. As the influential British economist and positive psychology advocate Lord Richard Layard writes, if we are asked why happiness matters, we can give no further external reason, 
It just obviously does matter. Is happiness measurement really a way of resolving moral and philosophical debate, or is it actually a way of silencing it? Once the technocrats are in charge, it is too late to raise any questions of intrinsic meaning or collective purpose. Happiness science is a science like no other because it always because it is always reaching beyond a mere object. What it grasps for is something meaningful, but it grasps, grasps for it via tools and measures that are too cold to adequately capture that meaning. Fechner's bizarre efforts to access transcendent truths via weightlifting have become an exemplar of how psychological management works today. Neurological, physiological, and behavioral monitoring devices are clamped together with meditation practices and pop existentialism. The philosophical deficit in the science of happiness is dealt with by importing ideas from Buddhism and New Age religions. Somewhere in between the quantitative science and the spiritualism sits happiness. The cultural effect of this is that certain indicators and measures of happiness take on a moral luminosity of their own, while happiness itself may remain invisible. A smile or a diagnosis, diagnosis of positive health acquires a sort of iconic value. The material symptom or indicator becomes a doorway into some inner being, granting it a magical quality. When Bentham idly wondered whether pulse rate or money might be the best measure of utility, he could scarcely have imagined the industries that would develop dedicated to asserting and reinforcing the authority of particular indicators to represent our inner feelings. Among these, no indicator has acquired a greater authority than money, an object that straddles the abstract and the material like no other.